take your Bibles in hand with you. Turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 13. Maybe I can ask all of us to read together verses 13 and 14. First Samuel chapter 13, and we can read verses 13 and 14 together. Let us begin. And Samuel said to Saul, Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. But now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord hath sought him a man after his own heart. And the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people. Because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. From here we get the title of the message, A Man After God's Own Heart. Let us pray. Oh, Father, indeed you are our Father, our role model, our example, the one to whom we look when we need anything in this life, the one who is our provider and our sustainer, the one who is our savior, redeemer, and restorer. We come to you today expecting that you are going to move aside the veil that would now expose who you are to us. Speak to every ear that hears your voice today. Use me as your instrument, thank you for the opportunity of working together with you. Now do your thing, Lord, and let thy name be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. A man after God's own heart. The old adage perhaps is still true today, maybe echoed amongst women folk in particular, whenever they gather together. And that old adage, perhaps made popular by a short story written by somebody called Flummery in 1953, which says that a good man is hard to find. And perhaps there is sufficient reason to justify this claim because admittedly, some of our men, not all, but quite a large number of our men have dropped the baton of being good fathers, brothers, uncles, road models, and persons to whom others can look to. We have here in Trinidad been greeted with so many incidents involving men that causes us to lose respect for the male species. Making headlines, even this week you would have seen, of, seen a man trying to brutally get rid of his once upon a time lover. The gun would not go off, so he would use the gun to smash her head. Thankfully, God intervened, and she is still alive. He did not make it, but she is still alive. A week ago, we would have read the gruesome story of gangster or men who came together and got rid. They succeeded in their exploits in getting rid of another man who they accused of being maybe pedophile in nature. Men doing things to men. And we see it happening all over. This week alone, we would have read of another one of our Seventh-day Adventist brothers from the Aruka Church who would have lost his life going to work. The pastor did indicate that he was not attending church but was on his way back to church. And the enemy thought it best to get rid of him before he would make his full recovery. Only God knows what is his outcome and his fate. I read a very saddening story or incident concerning a person from Virginia, Nathan Larson, who is running as a representative of Virginia for Congress, if you please. 
It is said in addition to admitting that he is a pedophile, in addition to admitting he is a pedophile, Larson is supportive of assisted suicide, white supremacy, and the legalization of child porn. He goes on to say, and I quote, since young girls begin to enter their years of peak beauty and fertility before the age of 18, it is unreasonable and unrealistic to expect them to wait till that age before having sex and children. He says, Lord have mercy, he speaks of his desire to have sex with his own daughter of whom he does not have custody. His wife committed suicide just before she would have passed away. As a result of the act, it is said that he raped her. This man is running for Congress, representing one of the states of the US. We live in a very sick society. And again, he's a representative of the male species. And so I could imagine the horror. I could imagine, and perhaps you are true, if you say that a good man is hard to find. Maybe in some regard it could be as a result of where you are looking for this good man or what you are looking for as well. Because you would understand that a woman's perspective of a man very often differs from the man's perspective of himself. Sometimes it runs contradistinction to who the man really is. Because I have learned, and this is not documented, that many women derive their opinion of men by interfacing with other women. No woman or no man is ever put on the witness stand. No man is interviewed to, for him to divulge who he really is. And I suppose the truth is also said of the converse that men do not understand women because we don't take the time to understand each other. In some cases, some women think that men ought to think the way they think. And so we men must develop the capacity to read and interpret emotions and feelings and mood swings without the woman having to share the same. And when we can't, we feel, or the woman feels as if we have fallen short. On the other hand, a man thinks that what is not important to him ought not to be important to her. And so there are some things that a woman thinks to be important to her and the man can't understand why. Because he doesn't understand the woman. The Bible reminds us that God made us male and female. We are similar but distinct. We are different. And if each of the sexes were to spend time, quality time in each other's presence, you will understand that we all, we both think differently. Women tend to tell you, and I'm, I'm sure you've heard of it, men. Women say that men are prone to be liars. Don't say amen, say. On the other hand, men would respond by saying, women cannot handle the truth. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I, if you are married you would understand what I'm talking about and for those of you who are thinking of getting married there are some questions that your wife will ask you that you ought to be careful how you answer mm -hmm. let me give you some pastoral advice here if a woman comes to you and asks you do you find I'm losing weight or gaining weight you don't answer a question like that. You, if you must answer, you say, Honey, I love you just the way you are. <laughs> amen, amen, amen. You don't, don't get into that trap. It's a trap. Yes, it's a trap. Another such question she may ask you, Honey, tell me the truth. You find Natalia more beautiful than I am? Now, how on the earth are you going to answer a question like that Especially if it is true. <laughs> it's a trap, I tell you. It's a trap. <laughs> you ought to respond by saying, Honey, if I were to get married all over again, it will be 
you. <laughs> yes, uh, you, try to, you try to skillfully maneuver yourself out of that. Uh, how much have you been thinking about me today? Don't answer. Because women cannot handle, oh Lord have mercy. One that may get you is a woman may come to you and say, now tell me something, if I did marry you, is there somebody else you would have married? Or perhaps, if I were to die, would you marry again? Don't answer. <laughs> Lord have mercy. Said only the Lord knows what will happen. But don't answer those questions. Because as men say, women cannot handle the truth. Now, whether these things are true or not is not the point. The fact is, we all perceive each other differently. Am I talking truth here? Without trying to excuse or de defend the male species or the male population, I believe that many men grow up with a false sense of security. Some men are confused as to, as to who they are or who they were meant to be. The roles and responsibilities they were meant to carry out. Men are confused and I'll tell you why they're confused because they get mixed signals from the people that they trust and they look up to because as they are growing up, they are taught to be tough. Are you still here with me? It's to be tough and to take it like a man. Take it like a man. But then at the same time, we are expected to be in touch with our emotions. To take it like a man. We are expected to be sensitive. But then when a man is too sensitive, what kind of man is that? Eh? He's a sissy. Look, look, look. Mm -mm. So we, we, the man grows up conflicted because he doesn't understand what a true man ought to be. And if he doesn't have a father to guide him, he is lost because now he has to depend on, on his friends who may not know as much to determine how he behaves. Am I talking truth to anybody here today? When, I, when my brother died in the mid-1980s, I was just a teenager still, and nobody teaches you how to cope with death. Am I talking to anybody here? Those of you who have been through that experience, nobody teaches you because I suppose nobody can teach you. It's a lesson you have to learn on your own. I'm the last of five boys, and when I saw my two elder brothers standing tall and strong, they were not shedding a tear. After I had shed my initial tears and the flow had, had evaporated, I wiped my eyes and I wiped my face, and I said, I have to be strong because my brothers, who I looked up to then, because they perhaps would have a better experience in dealing with this kind of pain, they were not crying, and so I felt I had to be strong. Foolishly, I thought it was a lack of faith for me to cry, because I am the only Christian in the house and I'm supposed to be strong because God is on my side. And so I refused to cry for no less than three months. Brother had died. He was just 19. I was 18. And, and I felt maybe if I cry, it would give them the impression that the God that I serve was not strong enough to take care of me. But then one day God confronted me. When I was alone, God has a way of confronting you when you're alone. Am I talking to anybody here? He has a way of confronting you when I'm alone. And when I was alone and he, he, he brought me to terms with my own emotions, my own feelings. And God burst the reservoir in my tear ducts. And the tears flowed for years after that. Sometimes I'll just be caught alone and I'll be just crying because I refuse to cry because men don't cry. They ought to be tough and strong and take it like a man. I will come to realize that a tough man is not necessarily a man who denies his weakness. It's not a man who camouflages his emptiness. But how can I express my deficiencies when as a man we are told that we must be in control? And many men have gone through the pain of hurt, but they can't show their emotions because you must be in control. 
must be in charge. It is one of the reasons that men prolong or avoid intimacy or intimate relationships because intimacy makes you vulnerable. And men hate to be vulnerable. Am I talking to any men in this house here? Because when you are taught you must be in control, how can you be vulnerable? Relationships make you vulnerable. And so when people ask you, are you dating this one? Oh, we're just friends. Because you don't want anybody to think that you are softening up. So you have to be strong and in control. It's also one of the reasons men hate religion. There are many more women who are attracted to Christianity than men are because religion demands sacrifice and sacrifice implies surrendering and men don't like to surrender. We like to win. Am I talking to myself here today? We like to win. Whenever men gather together, they don't talk about their deficiencies. They talk about their exploits. Sometimes their sex exploits. How much they have conquered. They talk like, we, we talk about, but that's why we like football. We like, that's why we like sports because sports is competitive. We like to battle. We play by rules, and whenever the rules of the game would change, it affects us because it threatens our stability to be in control. I'm just revealing to you, divulging to you women, what a man is like. A man hates to be vulnerable. One day, asked Adam, God called Adam and said, Adam, where are you? And to this date, Adam has not yet answered the question. Because you see, if divulging where I am is to divulge a place of insecurity, I prefer to tell you where I am not. Mm -hmm. Are you still here with me? I want to put this, the, the text on the screen for you to understand Adam's response. Go with me to Genesis chapter 3, verse 10. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 10. One is on the screen. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 10. Is it there? Genesis, Genesis chapter 3. Let me read it in your hearing because it's taken up. And, and he said, Adam's response. God said, Adam, where are you? Here's Adam's response to the question. A simple question. All he had to say is, I am not where I supposed to be. I am not where I used to be. But instead, this is how he chose to answer the question. He said, I heard your voice. Underline that. I heard the voice of another man. In the garden, stay with me ladies, this is going to be revolutionary. And I was afraid because I was naked. Underline the word because. Mm -hmm. I heard the voice of another man and I know I was vulnerable. But because I'm a man, men don't like to be vulnerable to other men. Oh Lord have mercy. The men are quiet today, I don't know why. We don't like to expose our weakness because when we get together, we talk about our victories. So we don't talk about where we are faltering. And because I knew it was you coming, I was afraid. Because I, I'm afraid if you saw me the way I am, you will see my weakness. So I hid myself because I was naked. Oh Lord have mercy. And that's one of the reasons men don't like to go to doctors. Because you see, we must be in control. And if a doctor tells me that something is wrong, it causes us to lose that control. It's also one of the reasons we don't like to go counseling. Because you see, a man must always be in control. And if I go to another man to tell him that I'm not in control, it makes me inferior as a man. And so I avoid counseling. So instead of telling the counselor I'm coming, I will tell him, we fixed it. Yes, we put on our fig leaves and it's fixed. When he knows he is naked, but if I could avoid showing you my nakedness and give you the impression that I'm all right, I prefer to expose my fig leaves than to expose myself. Hmm. Am I talking to anybody here this morning? 
That's how men think. And you see, you are confused. Why won't he come along with me for counseling when he knows something is wrong? Yes, because you see, if I go and I go for counseling and the something that is wrong is a result of what I am doing, it exposes me and tells me I am not in control. And men love to be in control. Are there any man in the house here today? Men love to be in control. Come on, say amen, please, man. Men love to be in control. But the prophet reminds us that men cannot control themselves. Oh Lord, Jeremiah says in Jeremiah 10, 23, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. It is not in you. You can't do it. You don't have what it takes to direct your own life, to be the author of your own destiny. Well, how can I run my life? I'm so glad you asked. Psalm 37 verse 23, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Could somebody say amen? The steps of a good man. You want a good man, ladies? Make sure he is ordered by the Lord. Make sure he is guided by God. Make sure he is directed by by the hand of God. It might be a bonus if he can open the door for you. If he can speak sweet nothings to you. If he is tall and he is the shape that you want and he is educated and he is ambitious. It's good. That might be a bonus. But if he has all of that but he is not ordered by the Lord, I don't know what he might do to you when the both of you get upset. If he is not ordered, he might use his fist to order you. Hmm. But if he is ordered by the Lord, that's a good man. Because you see, for a man to direct you, women, he must first be directed. I wish I Let me go to a text here found in Matthew chapter 8. Matthew, Matthew 8, Matthew 8, Matthew 8. Lord have mercy. I want to read from verse, is it verse 6? Well, yeah. Verse 6, well, verse 5. And when Jesus had, was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion, a man in charge, a superintendent in charge of soldiers, beseeching him and saying, Lord, my servant lieth home at home, sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus said unto him, I will come and heal him. The centurion said, oh, no, 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 no. Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof. Just speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. And let me tell you why I say that. Because I'm a man under authority. Are you still here with me? I'm a man under authority, having soldiers under me. Now, I must admit that when I was a teenager reading this text, I misread the text. Because I thought he said, I am a man of authority. But there's a difference between a man of authority and a man under authority. You see, he is saying that I am able to command because I am subje in subjection to authority. So that when they hear me, they don't listen to me because me alone have no voice. But because I am in subjection to somebody of higher power than I am, when they hear me, they hear the higher power that is speaking through me. Are you still here with me? And that's why they listen to me. Because if they refuse to carry out my instruction, they will have to deal with the one under whose authority I speak. Are you still here with me? Now those who are under me, they listen to me because I listen to the one who is over me. <laughs> And I'm saying to you men, if you have a woman who you consider to be a weaker vessel, if you've got to control her, make sure that you are under control by a higher, am I still, am I still, by a higher authority. That that's how you are able to command so that when she hears you, she must hear the one who is controlling you, the one who is over you. That's what, it's, that's what makes the man powerful. That's why women are not obliged to listen to any man. Because you see, the man under authority is a man in position. And the position you gave 
him is husband. When you said, I do, you made him your husband. Are you still here with me? And by making him your husband, then you have also subjected yourself to the authority. But if he reneges on that authority and is no longer in position, you are not obliged to listen to him anymore. Am I talking to anybody here? It's the same thing that happens all over. Anybody who is in power is under authority. And if that person now has vanquished or has somehow reneged on his responsibility and is no longer in authority, you are no longer obliged to listen to that person. So when this man says, I'm a man under authority, he says, I could command because I am commanded. I am ordered. And that's why you must get a man who is ordered by the Lord. Steps of a good man. The steps of a good man. The good man. The word good in that text simply means functional. So let's put it in this context. The steps of a man who functions properly. Oh, Lord have mercy. The steps of a man who functions as he's supposed to function is ordered or are ordered by the Lord. So if you're not ordered by the Lord, you're not functioning properly. Oh, Lord have mercy. That's why I declare to you, if you want a good man, don't just make sure he is ordered, but he must be ordered. Come on, talk to me, somebody. By the Lord. <laughs> he must be ordered by the law because that's what gives him the authority to do things and so when Adam said Adam said I mean the Bible says Adam ran away from the presence of God Adam ran away from his authority he felt more comfortable outside his authority and there's a text there's a part of the text that I focused on this morning as I was preparing this and that part says I hid myself so that now what you see is not all of me. And there are many men who are still in hiding. They hide their thoughts, their emotions, because you are supposed to be tough. So they hide who they are, and what you meet is not all that you got. Because we are told, somehow we, are, we have been taught that you ought not to reveal certain sides of you. So we have been hiding for a long time. When a man says to a woman, I can't trust you, it's different from when a woman says, I can't trust him. When she says, I can't trust him, she is speaking about, more than likely, infidelity. When he says, I can't trust you, is that I am not sure if the information I would share with you will come back to haunt me. Oh, sorry, sorry, men, you don't want to say anything right now. Uh, just look at me and pretend, what in the world is he talking about? I, he lost me right there. Let's ask Samson to make things easier for you. When Samson was asked by Delilah, tell me your secret, he kept it to himself. Because, you see, when a man tells a woman things that are deep inside of him, he inevitably becomes weak to her. Brother, you want to help me say amen? Well, he's a married man for many years. Yeah. When you, that's Brother Emmanuel Allen, when you share the innermost secrets, things that are inside, you are fearful. I hope when I tell you this, you will not use it against me. And that's exactly what Delilah did. Mm-hmm. And I'm saying that to let you know, because I know some of you, you can't say amen right now, because you, you have to mute your response, because, Pastor, what are you saying? You're blowing my cover, you're blowing, that's all right. I'm not talking about you, I'm talking about a man in the Bible called Samson. And that's one of the reasons Samson kept it to himself, because as long as he had this secret all by himself, he remained strong. Oh, Lord. But the moment you share, and it doesn't happen one way, it happens both ways. If a woman shares the deep things of herself, she becomes weak to the man with whom she shares it. 
Come on, talk with somebody. Please help me here. You become weakened by the man. And that's why you are careful as to how much you share. Because you know that once you share, you become vulnerable. And the more you share, is the more vulnerable you become. And so if I share all of this, do you promise to love and to cherish me and to keep me and not cheat on me? Hmm. I'm coming under your mascara today because, you see, I want you to understand how, what happens to a man's mind why he is perhaps the way he is. But the Bible says he hid himself. He hid himself because he, he, men don't like to expose themselves. If in exposing themselves, you recognize how weak we are. Hmm. So I put on a facade and I put on clothes, and when I take drugs, I hide myself. That's why when he drinks, when he wants to beat you, or when, when, he, when he wants to do things to you, he goes out and drink because he hiding, he's hiding behind alcohol. He cannot do it just like that because to do it just like that, he is too weak to raise his hand just like that. So he takes the bottle so that he can do it behind the bottle. Mm. And, and see, you have to understand that a, a, a man, though he is strong physically, to a woman, he is weak verbally. Mm -hmm. So while the woman can floor him with words, he can floor her with his hands. And very often, he uses his hands when he can't beat her with words. And sometimes her words, because they are so piercing, it causes him to use his hands. That causes him, it makes him want to use his hand because you see, a man must never lose. I suspect that's what's infecting a lot of relationships here today uh, because a woman may stand up to a man for her own rights and because she does it and he cannot win because a woman, a woman, I don't know what God did to women, but somehow you women are wired. You know exactly what to say to a man. You know exactly how to get a man angry. You know exactly how to pierce your arrows and send those arrows and send those darts and they do it without even thinking. They have those things, those arsenals waiting, waiting. Let me, and, 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 and we are fighting up, tight tonguing and all kind, trying to respond. And, uh, and they're just coming on to you. And because we can't fight back with words, we use our hands. And as a result, we become Hittites. <laughs> and because she can't take anymore, you becoming a Hittite makes her Levite. <laughs> Have oh, mercy, Jesus. Have oh, mercy, Jesus. And that's why I have a liking for a man called David, who the Bible describes as a man after God's own heart. Now it follows that if David is a man after God's own heart, then he should be a good man. Help me, somebody here. If he's a man after God's own heart, doesn't it follow that he's supposed to be a good man? Yes, but David was an adulterer. You all got quiet now. He was covetous. He used to steal. In local parlance, he used a thief. This same David was deceiving, conniving, contriving, and he was a murderer. And yet God called him a man after his own heart. What's wrong with God? Didn't you know he was going to commit adultery? Didn't you know he was going to commit murder? First degree murder. Didn't you know that? And yet you call him a man after your heart? He also had problems or manifested problems in his leadership. And then he also had problems in parenting. Yet this man is a man after God's own heart. What was God thinking? Let me go first. First, the first Corinthians, sorry, first Kings, first Kings chapter 15, first Kings chapter 15. Huh. I'm going to read from verse 1. Now, in the 18th year of King Jeroboam, Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, reigned Abijam over Judah. Three years reigned he in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Maka, or Mahaka, the daughter of Abishalom. And he walked in all the sins of his father, which he had done before him. And his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God. 
as the heart of David his father was. Nevertheless, for David's sake did the Lord his God give him a lamp in Jerusalem to set up his son after him and to establish Jerusalem. Here's the verse I want to come to. Because David did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord and turned not aside from anything that he commanded him all the days of his life, save only in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. So God was saying, David was a good man. But, but yes, I know he had a dark spot, but his heart was right. You see, when God comes to choosing, when it comes to choosing people, God does not look at the outward appearance. Hallelujah. He looks at the course of a man's mind, a man's heart. I like him. And the reason why God rejected Saul and chose David was not because David was more qualified. David was, his quality was not of greater stock. But the difference is their hearts. Come on, talk to me somebody. Saul will make a better conference president according to appearance. Oh, Lord have mercy. If you were to sit down on a committee and Saul, look at Saul's life. Look at why Saul was rejected. He was rejected because his heart was cemented in arrogance. He never committed adultery. You will never put David as president. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Come on, be real with me. You will never put him as president. You will quicker put Saul because the people will more gravitate to a man. Yes, he has stained, but look at what the, a murderer in the pew and in the pulpit. No way. You will quicker put Saul. I guarantee it. But God does not look at appearance. Not because he looks like a good president means that I tolerate him. Why then did you choose David? I'm so glad you asked. Because David's heart was pliable. <laughs> what do I mean by that? I can mold him. Paul was arrogant. Because when I confronted him, he started to blame other people as to what happened. I can't trust you. Because if you are in leadership, I need to know that when you're wrong, you're not wrong and strong. When you're wrong, you can confess. That's why I like David. Have mercy upon me, O oh God. According to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgression. That's a man I can use. That's a man after my heart. That's the kind of kindred spirit that I like. And when David said these words, he was still king. He was in charge. He could have said, no, I am not confessing. But David was soft to the will of God. He fell down, but he got up. Come on, talk to me, somebody. He fell down, but he got up. I can work with a man like that. That's the kind of man you would need to have. Not necessarily a man who is flawless. If we were to grade God in choosing David, we will give God an F. Come on, talk to me. We will give him an F. But you see, God did not look at the fact that David would commit no sin. He looked at the fact that when David would commit sin, he would say, Bless the Lord, O my soul, who healeth all my diseases and forgiveth all my iniquities. He will not come to me arrogant, but he will come to me pliable. His heart will be soft. I can mold him. That's the kind of person that I like. That's the kind of man that is good not a man who does not know to say I am sorry and I know many of you women have been married or are married to a man who does not like to say I'm sorry because he's in charge but David was in charge but he was still penitent oh Lord people getting quiet in this place he was in charge and I'm speaking with a passion because I believe that our society is filled with men who believe that they ought not to confess because you are a man. Don't let her think that you are soft. But God does not want, and this might shock you, God does not want strong men. 
God wants weak men. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Let me go on this side. God wants weak men. God doesn't want Samson when he is strong. He wants Samson when he's weak. So that every time he was about to do any exploits, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. He did not do it of his own self. And he became so arrogant that he said to himself, I will go out and shake myself. I will go out and I will shake myself as before. And that's when Delilah clipped him. That's when the enemy cut off your hair because you think it's all about you. Because of what you did, you think you did it. Not remembering that I came upon you and I did it in you. I don't want you when you are strong. I want you when you are weak. Because it is when you are weak, that's when you are strong. Help me somebody. When you are weak, that's when you are strong. I want a man who knows how to cry out to God for help. I want a man who knows that even when he can't, God is able. I want a man who knows that though this thing is impossible, with God all things are possible. I want a man who knows how to pray, not out of his own desire to show and to impress people and that he can use words, but I want a man who can pray out of the bowels of his own need for God. I just want a man like David who will pant after me as a deer panted after the water brook. I want that kind of man. That's the man after my own heart. Oh, that's the man that makes a good man. So even as you look for a good man, if the man is not under subjection to God, then he's under subjection to somebody else or to something else and you don't know what he will do. And that's why I'm happy to introduce to you this man called David, who was a shepherd boy. And even when he was out of sight, he came with a resume to King Saul and said, Saul, I don't know why you guys are running from this uncircumcised Philistine. What do you mean, why? You, have you seen this dude? Yeah, but I've also seen the Lord. <laughs> Come on, talk to somebody. I have also seen the Lord. And when I was in the wilderness, I composed a psalm that perhaps I could tell you. You want to hear the psalm, Saul? Of course. Well, the Lord is my shepherd. <laughs> I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for God is with me. You sure you can do this? Yes. You show yes, because there was a time when a lion and a bear came and they grabbed one of my sheep. I was angry. If they were just around, I wouldn't take them on, but don't touch my sheep. <laughs> when you touch my sheep, you get me upset. You can circle around all you want, but the moment you lay your hands on my sheep, you're touching private property. I want to declare to you that Jesus is my shepherd. And when he, then Satan comes in like a flood to lay his hand upon what belongs to God, the Lord will lift up a standard against him. I wish I'm talking to somebody here today and let him know thus far and no further because you're touching my sheep. And with my hands, the Lord gave me the strength to conquer a lion and a bear. Folk, I don't know if you could visualize with me. How could a man, this, this, this guy was hardly a teenager and he was able to get to overcome a lion and a sheep and, and, and a bear, sorry. Lion and a bear. But with God, all things are possible. You sure about this? Yes. These wild beasts that come upon my sheep. No way. You're not going to touch them and get away. These wild creatures, wild creatures, wait, wild creatures, these wild, wild creatures, because very often these wild creatures come upon us. <laughs> yes, these wild creatures that come upon us in our wilderness, wild, wild creatures. Nobody teaches us how to conquer these wild creatures. And all of you get these wild creatures come upon you when you are entering into puberty. Oh, oh Lord, have mercy. No, no, let me go to a side that is more real. These wild creatures, these wild beasts that come upon you, uh, uh, women, you have the time of the month after the cycle is ended that these wild 
Oh, let me go back on this side. These wild creatures come upon you, and you're wondering, how on earth can I conquer this? He, he says, Lord, I'm going crazy. They're telling me I must take a bath. But the cold showers don't always work when these wild creatures come upon you. And for the men in our house today, we are told that the man's basic need is sex. Yes, I said it, that S word, S-E-X. But it is said in a derogatory manner that all men require is sex. That's all they want. I almost ask you what else, but <laughs> what else you want us to want. But I, I'm saying that's all men seem to want. But the fact of the matter is God gave you the desire. And without the desire, you won't have children. I'm talking to myself here again. Let me go here. Without the desire, let's be real here today. If none of you, if your parents never had a desire, then they have to program a date or plan a date as to when the two of them could get together. Because the Bible says we must be fruitful and multiply. Would Friday night work for you? Oh no, Friday is the Sabbath of the Lord like God. We dare not do these things on Friday. What about Saturday night? You're free Saturday night? Okay, we, we'll make a date. What time? 8.30? No, 8.31. That's a better time. Okay, fine. And, and they will happen at a particular time. But you see, when a desire comes upon you, you don't have to plan any schedule. Brother Je Sister Jenny? Look at me as you know what I'm talking about. Jennifer, you're talking about? Oh, sorry, don't, don't talk too loud. <laughs> when it comes upon you, you know, and the fact is, God gave all of us, well, most of us, this desire. Because some of us who are not saying amen don't have it. <laughs> the desire never comes. But, but I'm saying to you, it comes upon you. But the truth of the matter is, when the desire comes, he says the steps of a good man are ordered. <laughs> and the difference between a man who explores these wild beasts and one who doesn't is the one that doesn't is ordered. Come on, talk to me, somebody. I, I'm ordered. I have a structure, I have a plan. They come upon me. I don't deny those feelings. But I'm ordered. And before you learn to fight Goliath in public, learn to deal with those wild beasts in private. Because you are ordered but it would be remiss of me ladies and gentlemen to let you leave here focusing only on David a man after God's own heart he is but there's another shepherd who became king or a shepherd king who is a man after God's own heart but somebody say amen one day Jesus was in the baptismal pool and he heard a voice from heaven saying, You are my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. You are a man after my own heart. Now I can put you in the wilderness. Now that you've heard what I said to you, I can now carry you in the wilderness. Because you see, if I'd never told you who you are, it would be easy for you to fall. It's a lesson for all fathers. If you don't tell your sons who they are, then they will fall by the enemy when they are tempted. But if you remind them that you are a child of God, that you are special, remind them that there's coming a time when you will enter into your wilderness. There will be a time when you will be tempted. Yes, the Bible says the Spirit led Jesus to be tempted. Yes, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And sometimes those steps take you into the wilderness. For those of you who were recently baptized, take note, after Jesus was baptized, the next step was the wilderness. After you have been baptized and you have given over your heart to Jesus, somebody will take you to the bar. Somebody will be smoking and asking you, take, take, take a smoke. You will be tempted and you never understand the power of temptation until you start to resist it. Jesus was there and notice what the devil says to him. He wanted to deny Jesus what he just heard. He says, if you are what he says you are, if you are the son of God, command that these stones be turned to bread. Jesus had to remind himself, I am the son of God and I don't have to yield myself to your wishes because of what you said because I have learned to listen to what my father says 
This is instructive, brothers and sisters and fathers in the house. When you tell your son who they are, they don't have to join any gang to prove it. Because my father told me that I'm special. Ladies, it also goes for women. Fathers, when you tell your girls how beautiful they are, no man can swindle their mind and try to take away their virginity because you have already told them how special they are and they don't have to prove it before any teenage man. Just remind them who they are. Yes, you are special in the sight of the God. And that's why it's important that fathers tell their children who they are so that they can live up to what daddy says. Yes, Satan, I am the son of God. And I don't have to prove it in order for you to see it because I know it because my father said it. Steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And he delighteth in his way. Though he stumble, he shall not utterly fall. Why? Because the Lord <laughs> shall hold him up. Oh, this is awesome. I know this excites me. Because you see, because he's being ordered, the implication is he will stumble. You can't stumble if you're not walking. You can't fall if you are not standing. That's why God looks at the motions of your heart. And he knows that this guy, when he falls, he will not stay down. Because his vision is to get to his final destination. So though he stumbles, he will not utterly fall. Because he depends on the Lord to order his steps aright. I thank God for ordering the steps of a good man. Come on, talk to me somebody. Once you're being ordered by the Lord, you can now walk with God. So when the enemy comes in and tempts you, tell him, I'm under strict orders. Yes, I used to drink, but I'm under new management now. <laughs> Could somebody say amen? Yes, I used to sleep around, but I'm on, under new management here. Yes, I used to take drugs, but I'm under new management here. This morning, we interviewed a woman who was a lesbian, but now she is getting married to a man because she's under new management. I'm telling you, it is possible in the sight of God. If God is ordering your life, the things you used to do, you will do them no more because now you are under new management. I am following strict orders that's why i will not stay down this time when i fall because the just may fall seven times but if i'm falling seven times i'm also standing because i have to stand before i can fall <laughs> and if i don't stay down i am standing up at least eight times let me say it again. If the just man falls seven times and he gets back up, it implies he is standing eight times, which means he is standing more than he is falling. Could somebody say amen? He is standing up more than he is falling. That's why I can trust David, because when he falls, he admits it, but he gets back up. <laughs> and he stands again, and he does not put any fig leaf over his profession. Because he tells you, yes, I was a sinner. Yes, I did it. But I'm standing. While you, yes, you hypocrite and you Pharisees, watch my fall. God is watching my stand. And that's why he says, I'm a man after his heart. I like this man. Because he comes after me even though he falls down. Gets back up, he prays. Sometimes he's disgusted by what he does, but he still comes. He, he's not afraid to show his vulnerability, but he gets back up and he stands with me.